Facebook Live friends, welcome back for the November 11th thought paper called the Unconditional Abrahamic Covenant. The Unconditional Abrahamic Covenant has to be understood in light of the fact that the fall of Adam was a planetary matter and not just a matter of particular set of people who were chosen by God to administer the planet on his behalf. The matter was simply a part of the plan of he who made to set up his throne on planet Earth by way of the Messiah, who would, ulti who would ultimately be Jesus Christ or the second Adam, who would sit on the throne of David, which to all intents and purposes will be the throne of God on planet Earth. The first indication is what is found in Revelation 13, that the Lamb was slain prior to the foundation of the world. This matter of a fallen planet, as well as its ransom by way of perfect everlasting righteousness, and not by a servant nation, was already determined prior to the creation of planet Earth, which means that it was determined prior to the fall of Adam. Later, the next indicator was the Messianic promise of Genesis 3.15, and then the calling of Abraham, who was called by God to produce a nation of priests and kings. The current belief regarding the unconditional covenant has the primary teaching that the physical land of Israel would always belong to a people who called themselves Jews regardless of being obedient or disobedient. The blessings and cursings of Deuteronomy 28 provide sound answers for such a false teaching. Later came Isaiah 53 in fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. Regarding what God told Abraham about the stars of the sky, Deuteronomy 28 states the following. And ye have been left with few men, instead of which ye have been as stars of the heavens for multitude, because thou hast not hearkened to the voice of Yahweh thy God. What brings confusion regarding this teaching is the following. If the original plan was in relation to the restoration of the whole planet, of redeemed people, and not just a servant nation, this would then be our starting point. God later called out Abraham to establish a servant nation and the Messiah's genetic line from the time of Adam and Eve would arrive through the lineage of Abraham to whom God gave the unconditional covenant. Later on, specific things would take place which would confirm the covenant, such as he who made telling Abraham that his descendants would be like the stars of the sky, and that they would become a company of nations, as well as a great nation. Genesis 15, 5, and Genesis 22, 17 to 18. As strange as this may seem, this plurality of being a commonwealth of nations and great nation has never been fulfilled in the tribe or house of Judah, which was one of the twelve tribes of Israel through which the Messiah Jesus Christ would be born. The Scepter Prophecy The prophecy stated that the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes, whose right it is. Genesis 49.10 So this specific prophecy forms a part of the unconditional Abrahamic covenant. Since Abraham was told kings would issue forth from him, Here is where the mystery begins, since the house of Judah only fulfilled the kingly aspects 
as well as producing the Messianic line of kingship by way of the two sons of Tamar, by way of Judah, namely Perez and Zerah, line of kingship. The mystery then again deepens even more since one line of kingship, that of Perez, became extremely prominent, whereas the other, that of Zerah, was pretty much, if not totally unknown, or unrecognized, or ignored, for some unknown reason. History attests to the fact that Jesus was of the line of David, namely the Perez, Perez line, house of Judah. So the fact is that the house of Judah was never a global power, and after the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, as well as his rejection, the kingdom of Judah was conquered by the Romans who destroyed the second temple in 70 AD. This was all confirmed by the chrono chronological prophecy of the 70 weeks of Daniel. So for 1900 years, up to the Six-Day War of June 1967, Judah never fulfilled any of the commonwealth promises or great nation status as given to Abraham by he who made. Some might argue and say that these promises were fulfilled during the time of King Solomon, whose first temple in Jerusalem marked the golden age of he who made his witness to the world, since at that time all 12 tribes of Israel were under the rulership of King Solomon, up to the time when he died and his son Rehoboam took over, and on account of King Solomon's unfaithfulness, God permitted the division of his kingdom. Ten tribes seceded from the Union, and only Judah and Benjamin remained in the south, with Jerusalem being the capital and still the center of worship. Later, King Jeroboam of the northern kingdom established his religious center of worship in order to prohibit his nation from worshiping in Jerusalem as required by he who made. He departed from the faith, and later the succeeding kings of the northern kingdom did the same, and he who made permitted the Assyrians to take them captive as a people around 722-721 BC. The Assyrians removed the native populations and placed other conquered peoples, as well as their own people, in the territories of the northern kingdom, and these people came to be known as the hated Samaritans. Kingship of, Sol Kingship of Solomon. Yet this was also a brief interlude, since Solomon fell away and the kingdom became divided. The great nation and commonwealth of nations status is still missing, since it was Jerusalem under Solomon's kingship and wisdom that the different nations of the world flocked to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Some would still claim that the unconditional Abrahamic covenant took place in 1948. Yet the mysterious prophecy of Genesis 9.27 clearly reveals a Japhetic people as fulfilling this restoration. The words of Egyptian President Nasser confirm this prophecy by stating that the Hebrews left Palestine being black and returned being white. The fact is that Ashkenaz was a son of Japheth. 1948. It was in 1948 that the tents of Shem have been enlarged. And it was Great Britain of the Commonwealth that made this possible as well via instruments such as the Balfour Declaration in 1917. The prophecy continues with the mindset of the Old Covenant and the mindset of Rabbinic Judaism stating the following in Genesis 9.27. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. Whereas in the New Covenant, this mindset of supremacy doesn't exist since there are no male, female, Jew or Greek or Scythian. All are one in Christ.
restoration of the old vineyard owners refuted by Christ. The words of Jesus in reference to the vineyard and what the owner would do to those who killed his son Luke 20, 10 to 16, as well as the 70 weeks of Daniel 9 and its determination of the people of the prince who would come, as well as Matthew 23 and the statements about your house being left desolate and the statement about the cursed fig tree, which would never bear fruit ever again, all leave one thinking that the door was shut. And don't get this wrong. It was based on the words of Jesus that the unconditional nature of the covenant would continue since the original tenants were cast out, yet the unconditional elements pertain to the truth of Israel in the hours of the parabolic time clock of Matthew 20, which are 6 a.m., 9 a.m., 12 p.m., 3 p.m., and 5 p.m. Notice what Jesus stated about the matter, the workers in the vineyard. Verse 1 makes it very clear. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that was a householder who went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a shilling a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing in the marketplace idle. And to them he said, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. And he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard. And when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, Call the laborers, and pay them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired, about the eleventh hour, they received every man a shilling. And when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received every man a shilling. And when they received it, they murmured against the householder, saying, These last have spent but one hour and thou hast made them equal unto us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. And he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not thou agree with me for a shilling? Take up that which is thine, and go thy way. It is my will to give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I would with my own? Or is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. According to this parable, the schematic of the vineyard it is based on certain workers that are called at specific periods of time in Earth's history. That is why we can refer to this as a parable time clock. Since it involves the early morning hours of the day, 6 a.m., and con concludes in the late hours of the working day, such as 6 p.m., it is not to be interpreted as being a literal 24 hours, day of 24 hours. It is a parable of prophetic periods of time which began with the exodus from Egypt all the way up to the events of Revelation 18, since these events mark the time frame of the setting sun in world history and are another major study as well as a major overhaul of current evangelical as well as Jewish teaching regarding the interpretation of of the unconditional Abrahamic covenant. The link is below to our YouTube channel. Um, in the playlist, you can find the videos on the parabolic time clock for further study. This is confirmed also by the words of Jesus. God can make stones as followers of Abraham. How did Jesus confirm this new schematic? The answer is not in relation to the promise of the physical land, as promoted by the evangelicals, but by spirit and truth. John 4 says, The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. 
Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall ye worship the Father. Ye worship that which ye know not, we worship that which we know, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such doth the Father seek to be his worshippers. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, he that is called Christ. When he is come, he will declare unto us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Luke 3. Bring forth therefore fruits, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Galatians 3. But before faith came, we were kept in ward under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed, so that the law is become our tutor to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith is come, we are no longer under a tutor, for ye are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as are were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There can be neither bond nor free. There can be no male and female. For ye are all one man in Christ Jesus. And if ye are Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. So what does Paul have to say in reference to the land? And how does it equate with the words of Jesus? Which things contain an allegory for these women are two covenants one from mount sinai bearing children under bondage which is hagar now this hagar is mount sinai in arabia and answers to the jerusalem that now is for she is in bondage with her children but the jerusalem that is above is free which is our mother fulfillment of the unconditional Abrahamic covenant. Revelation 21. And there came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, who were laden with the seven last plagues. And he spake with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, Having the glory of God, her light was like unto a stone most precious, as it were a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Revelation 21. And the nations shall walk amidst the light thereof, and the kings of the earth bring their glory into it. And the gates thereof shall in no wise be shut by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything unclean, or he that maketh an abomination and a lie, but only they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a river of water of life, bright as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street thereof, and on this side of the river and on that was the tree of life, bearing twelve manner of fruits, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no curse any more. And the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be therein. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall be no night no more, and they need no night of lamp light of lamp, neither light of sun, for the Lord God shall give them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Conclusion The unconditional Abrahamic covenant consists not of the old Jerusalem, 
which in present time is in theological slavery, but the new covenant, which is unconditional, is based on better promises, such as the heavenly Jerusalem, and not the present day agitation of who owns or claims to own the physical real estate which is presently in theological slavery. And here's where you can click on YouTube channel. And you click on playlist. And let's see, where is it? Here it is right here, the parable at the front of Matthew. Just click on that, and it'll play all of them in order. Okay? Hope that helps. God bless. Till next time.